you for being here. I know it can be tough sometimes, especially with the deadlines now that you all had right this week. But I think most of you should be done. Inshallah. So let's move on. Day number three. A very quick revision. Quicker than yesterday. Day number one. Actually, let's do this one like this. I don't want you to get distracted by the here. Okay. Now today is uh, uh, Wednesday, right? Yeah. Okay. okay. Day number one. Very quick recap. Africa. Why do we start with Africa? Wilhelm, why do we start with Africa? <laughs> You hear that? Yeah. So, because Africa was the first place actually where Muslim migrated to, and not only this one, the most important thing was that the first ruler in the world accepted Islam, and he was an African. He was not an Arab. Yes. Okay. Quite a mind-blowing thing, isn't it? I really don't like when it's open. I feel observed. <laughs> so it's quite a mind-blowing thing if you imagine. That it was not an Arab, it was not a Turk, it was not anything else, but it was an African, a Najashi, in a Christian country nowadays, which is claims to be a very Christian country, right? Which is nowadays Ethiopia. Habasha, Abyssinia, Ethiopia. Right. 615, that was the first hijra of the Muslims, okay? The first ones to leave Mecca, and they had to, basically because of persecution, as we all know. Good. So they went to Africa, and that's why we start with Africa. That was the continent that actually accepted Islam full-heartedly first. Okay? Next, what else can we say about Africa? Quickly. Now, this was East Africa, right? Okay? Ethiopia, Eritrea, Djibouti, this part of Africa, East Africa going down to Kenya, Tanzania, right? This is all East Africa. What else can we say about East Africa? How did Islam spread further? Three. So, the Najashi accepts Islam. So, what then? Three. Okay, trade who, what? Uh, through Egypt and Eastern Africa. Not East Africa. East Africa itself did mm. not have trade with Egypt. Mm. But mainly with? Ethiopia. Ethiopia, East Africa. With whom did they have trade? West Africa. Syria. With Morocco Egypt last. What about the Arabs, guys? What about Oman and Yemen? Okay, look at the closeness, look at the proximity, okay? Now, if you have the map in front of you, I don't have it at this moment, but we're going to put it later on, inshallah, again, just a recap later. But look at how close Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, is to Eritrea, Djibouti, Ethiopia. Very close. And they used to have trade relationships long before Islam came to Arabia. Long before Prophet Muhammad. There was already a relationship, okay? Right? So that's why, have you ever seen, there are many Yemenis who are very dark in color. Okay, they're not Africans, they're Yemenis. Okay, long before Islam, already there was an exchange, you know, and the same in Oman. You will also find Omanis who are quite dark in color. Okay, you'll find black Omanis, you'll find darker Omanis, you'll find all that because of the relationship and the close Africa, especially to the Arabian Peninsula, right? Okay, so... That's one thing. So East Africa, so Islam spread by the sword to East Africa, right? No. The Muslims went down and they said, you accept Islam, otherwise we're going to kill you, right? No. No, no. No, no. so trade. Yes. Clearly trade, right? All right. So now we have countries like Kenya, for example, which is 35% Muslim. The south of Kenya is entirely Muslim. Okay. Tanzania. What's the capital of Tanzania? What's the capital of Tanzania? The House of Peace. Dar es Salaam. Okay? Mombasa in the south of Kenya, entirely Muslim, right? The island of Zanzibar, which belongs to Tanzania today, was the center of the trade between the Arabs and East Africa. Alright? Good. So East Africa, trade. From East Africa, Islam goes further into Central Africa, Southern Africa, okay? Into the hinterland, okay? What they call. Good. What about West Africa? What about North Africa? How did Islam go there? Quickly, Egypt. What happened with Egypt? Yeah. Egypt is North Africa, right? So what happened to them? No part of West Africa? 
Yeah, yeah, okay, but what happened to North Africa first? How did it go to in Egypt? In Egypt, we had already Christians living there before, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Okay? And Ethiopia. These were the two points that we said yesterday again. We reminded ourselves that there were two points where we had Christians before the Muslims in Africa. Put, put the, Just two. Akbar. Put. In? Akbar. Copts, Copts, yes. Copts. That's right, that's right. They are called Copts. Orthodox branch, right? The Coptic people in Egypt, they are from the Orthodox branch. There are three big branches in Christianity. Are you aware of this? Three big branches in Christianity. Number one is, the biggest one, the Catholics. What do they do? What is their symbol? Who do they believe in? The Pope. The Pope. Honestly, they believe in the Pope. And they say that the Pope is infallible. That means he doesn't make mistakes. He is a representative of God on this planet. Can you understand why so many Catholics have left their religion? Yeah. I can. Okay? All right. Now, the Pope is infallible. He's a representative of God on earth, so he doesn't make mistakes. That's the basic uh, understanding of, of, of their religion. What's, what's Pope? The Pope is in the Vatican, in Rome. The, the Baba, big guy. The Papa. Yeah. Ah. Okay? He's the big guy, right? So he is a representative of God on earth. He is God on earth. He doesn't make mistakes. Okay? Maso. He doesn't make mistakes. Exactly. Okay? Next. That's the Catholics. Protestant. The Protestants. What about them? Who are they? What Protestants? The Anglican Church belongs to that branch. Who are the Protestants? Quickly. They um, were more factual. They don't believe in Trinity? There is no Christian that doesn't believe in Trinity. They, That's they, their doc dogma. Hmm? Uh, they didn't want to believe in the Pope in the sense of they wanted more factual things, i.e. books and etc. Uh, okay, they, the important thing is they don't believe in the Pope. Hmm. Okay, what happened? Why are they called Protestants? Because they protested against the Catholic establishment. The church establishment in the 15th, 16th century, Martin Luther, right? Switzerland, right? Germany, the Protestant Reformation. Why do you think the Protestant Reformation happened in the 15th, 16th century? And we're getting off. But the important thing is the influence of the Muslims from Spain. Okay? Many of these Protestants had studied in Spain. In Spain, that was 700 years Muslim, Al Andalus. And they went back and they had the idea of Tawhid in their head. And they went back and saw the Pope and the church people, the clergy, you know, in their gold and everything, and said, This cannot be. This is not our Christianity. This is not what Jesus preached. And they were right. Okay? So that's why they were called Protestants. Okay? And the Catholics started, started fighting against these people who protested against the church. Okay? Right. And then the third group, which is actually even older, is the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Orthodox people. You know? Where the Copts belong to, the Ethiopians belong to, the Greek Orthodox people belong to, the Romanians belong to, the Bulgarians, the Russians, Eastern Europe and the East, you know, and East Africa, you know. So these people, they have their own bishop, okay? They have their own big person, like the Pope, they believe in. And his seat is in Constantinople. Constantinople does not exist anymore. Constantinople is Istanbul nowadays. It has become part of Turkey. And that's when they lost the Orthodox Christianity, became part of the Muslim world until nowadays. In the Muslim world, in the Middle East, most of the Christians are actually Orthodox people, like in Syria, like in Egypt, like in Jordan, like in Palestine, in Lebanon. You will find Orthodox Christians, okay? And they believe they have their own bishop. Five seats all over the world are in that region. The most important one in Istanbul, Constantinople then in Moscow, then in Athens, then in Syria, Damascus, then in Egypt, okay? Antiochia. So, all this makes the three big groups of Christianity. All right. West Africa, how did Islam go from North Africa to West Africa? Trade. Who was trading with whom? Yemenis. North Africa, who Berbers. was living in North Berbers. Africa? The Berbers. the Berbers. Who are the Berbers? They're not Arabs. They're not Arabs, they're the indigenous people of North Africa. They have their own language, their own culture, their own tradition, and they accepted Islam by what? When? Trade. By how did they? No, not how. When did they accept Islam? Fully? The whole Berber nation? Um, 
700. 700, very good. That's something, you know, we're not, I'm not too keen on dates, but there are certain things that it's good to know. So in the year 700, the whole Berber nation in North Africa was Muslim. By 711, Tariq bin Ziyad, Tariq bin Ziyad another Berber, put foot in Spain, Gibraltar. In Spain, that was the opening of Europe to Islam. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're discussing yesterday. So, from North Africa, Islam spread into West and Central Africa, and from North Africa, Islam spread to Europe, to the North, meaning the Iberian Peninsula, which is what? Who is the Iberian Peninsula? Two big countries? Spain, Spain and Portugal, with Gibraltar, also there, which is a British colony, right? We should not forget this. Okay, so, from there now, what happened then next in Spain, in Portugal? The Muslims were there then. Any other country was affected by the Muslims? France. Very good. France. Which, who, where, what? All of France? No, it's that little. Which one? Uh, no, no. Fraxini. Fraxini. What is Fraxini? Where is Fraxini? Uh, France. South of France. Where? What is the city nowadays called? Or which area? South West. South of France. Where? Which area? Pause. Monaco, Nice, Saint Tropez. Okay? Nice. This whole area, okay? Where the rich meet nowadays, right? Nice, Saint Tropez, Monaco, this area, okay? Now, from there, what happened there? These people who established Islam there for around 100 years, where did they come from? Andalus. And they were called Andalusis. Because they came from Al Andalus. Mm -hmm. Sevilla, yeah. They came from Al Andalus. And they established Islam, a settlement in the south of France. What happened from there? Where else did they go from there? Switzerland. To Switzerland, thank you very much. What happened in Switzerland? Yeah, they took over pretty much all of it. it got as close to as Germany. Very good. As close as Zangallen in the north of, of Switzerland, which is actually the border of Germany. Okay? And they were doing trade. They had relationships there. People were, they accepted them. Okay? So they had them actually as partners there as well, as trade partners, right? Good. When was that? Which century? Ten. Are you making the same thing? <laughs> so it's 900, okay? Tenth century. Tenth century they were in Switzerland, okay? And from 711 all this was happening. 732, another important date. So one date is 711, another date is 732. 711 is when Tariq bin Ziyad arrived in Gibraltar. 732 is when? Tour and Poitiers. That's when the French kept the rest of the Muslim army or whatever they were, kept them away. So they came up to these two cities, up to Tour and Poitiers, which is around 50, 60 kilometers from Paris. Okay? That happened 732. You have to remember that. Simply because in France nowadays there's a new movement. It's called Génération Identitaire. They come out and they say, 732 is their symbol, meaning we hit them that time back, we're going to hit them again today. Okay? So when they say, when they use 732 as their symbol, they want to say, we French kept them out of Europe, we're going to keep them out again. France, France is the country that has in Western Europe the majority of Muslim, the biggest Muslim minority in Western Europe. Western Europe. If you consider Russia being part of Europe, then it's Moscow. Moscow is the biggest urban Muslim community in the, in the world. Moscow has more than two million Muslims. Okay? So now, after that, 732, Tour en Poitiers, 10th century, which means 900, right? 900 onwards, they reached Switzerland. Switzerland was a part of the Muslim Empire until 965, 970, and so on. Some Muslims remained, but most of them were kicked out. As soon as the Christians take a country over, what do they do with the Muslims? They get rid of them. And the Jews. Let's be honest. And the Jews. They're just waiting for that, right? The Jews and the Muslims. Right? So, what happens when Muslims rule a country? They embrace everyone. What is this policy called? Uh, the Jizya. Very good. To the one who said it correctly, la convivencia. Okay? Coexistence, living together. Spain, Portugal, Italy. What about Italy? Sicily, the island of Sicily. You said somebody mentioned this before. 
Couscous. <laughs> the national dish of Sicily, couscous. Very good, okay? How did they get it? Because of the Muslims from North Africa, okay? Good. So, Sicily was also part of the Muslim Empire for around 200 years. Massive, right? What about Malta? What happened to Malta? Libya. Okay, what about Malta? Very good. Maltese, their own language is actually an Arabic dialect. It's the only Arabic dialect written in Latin, with Latin letters. Okay? Now, that's what remained behind. What remained behind in Sicily and in Italy, we saw some of the architectural parts. They fused Muslim architecture into their new Renaissance architecture. If you go throughout Italy, you will find, you know, certain, you know, typical architectural uh, buildings with typical architecture which reminds you of Muslim art. It's a fusion. That's what happened in Cyprus too. That's what happened in many other parts in Europe, okay? Gothic art. Have you ever heard of Gothic art? Mm -hmm. Gothic? Gothic art. Gothic art in France especially, yes. You know, they look like this. It's like a big church. You know? And then they have kind of, you know, they have kind of triangular type of windows and arch, you know, which is all Islamic. This is Islam. Okay? Crescent, yes. Crescent, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, all right. So that's Gothic art. Indeed, heavily influenced each other. We should not forget that they all influenced each other. And I give you a quick example before we move on with regards to Italy. I want to read out something. You remember a city in Italy which was never Muslim? You remember that? Which one was that? Um, oh, um, one with the water. What's it called? Exactly, Venice. one with the water. What's it called? Venice. Venice, yes. Venice, Venezia. Venice, this city, is heavily influenced by the Muslims and architecture and everything, you know. Um, but the Muslims never entered Venice. And I will read out something to you from The Economist. It says, there was rich artistic and cultural exchange between East and West. Glass blowing came from the Islamic world. Glass blowing in order to make the ceramic and in order to make the souvenirs that they sell nowadays in Italy, Spain, and Portugal. This came from the Muslims. The vessels on display show how the Venetians emulated the Islamic art of enameling glass in gold and color, leather book binding, pigments for paints and majolica, white glazed pottery. All came from the East, although the Venetians never succeeded in imitating the perfect ruby glaze of Isnic pottery, the trade worked both ways, with Venetians exporting jewels, books, silks, and ingenious mechanical tools to the East. The first printed Quran came from Venice. The first printed Quran came from Venice, Italy. It was made in Venice for the Turkish market in the 15th century. Where are you? Who waiting for you? <laughs> not true. It's not true. We started already. Ha. So, 15th century, the first printed Quran, made in Venice, printed in Venice. Guys. Sorry? The Jews. The Jews were allowed to, to use printing press. It's not where the Jews, most of the Jews from Andalus went to Venice. Exactly. Exactly, and that's why the Renaissance came also. They brought them with them. That's right. Very true. Many of the Jews who left Al Andalus were welcome in the Ottoman Empire. Many of them went to the Ottomans. Many of them went to Morocco, and that's why Morocco had a big Jewish community recently before Israel. And many others went to Italy, Venice. Okay? Sultan Mehmed II, the conqueror of Constantinople, wanted his portrait pen painted, and since Islamic painting focused on calligraphy and miniatures, being painted by a top Venetian portraitist was the ultimate luxury. Bellini's profile portrait of Mehmed sniffing a rose is a masterpiece of cross-cultural exchange. I don't know if you've ever seen that. I must have it in between. You know, you see an Ottoman sultan with turban sniffing on a rose. That Sultan Mehmed Fatih, the opener of Constantinople, and he had his portrait made by Bellini, an Italian painter. Okay? 
Now, something that they don't say here, of course, we know that in Islam, we are not supposed to draw faces and animals and pictures and, uh, and people. So that's why it was not developed in such a way. But yeah, well, you know, and that's when the Arabs come and say, the Turks made a lot of mistakes, you know. There is a problem and a hostility among Arabs and Turks because the Ottomans were the next one, they the last ones to take over after the, Ubay the, Abay the Umayyads and the Abbasids. Uh, became useless, you know, I mean, when the Arabs became useless, other people came to exchange them. Allah, that's what Allah does. Yeah. Allah exchanges a people with another people. Yeah. Now, to say that the Turks uh, are this and this and that, and to have a kind of hostility feeling towards the Turks, is unfair. Just because they're Arabs does not make them better than anybody else who is a Muslim, right? So, now, next point after this one, or the last point actually, you know what the, one thing that we didn't mention yesterday, I forgot. You know what the Muslims left behind in France, by the way? Fraxine, okay, fine and good. So, where they were not even 100 years in Fraxine. They took this as a base and they went to Switzerland, to Italy, North Italy, and to other parts of France. What did they leave behind, guys? What do you think the French benefited from, from, the, from the Muslims, which they don't tell you nowadays? Books. Poetry. Art. One thing, poetry and art. Poetry, who were the ones who became famous in France? We spoke about it yesterday, we had the word on the board. Trans... True. True Badours. The True Badours from the Provence. The True Badours took the idea and the art of poetry over from the Muslims and suddenly became a True Badour art. It became something French. Okay? And they, this helped the Renaissance and the intellectual development of, of Europe. Okay? One thing. Another important thing. What is the export good of France number one? Wine. 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 How do you close wine? Cork through. How do you close a bottle of wine? Cork. 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 Where does cork come from? Trees. How do you do it? The Muslims told them how to do it. The cork industry in the south of France until nowadays, the country, the city, which used to be called Fraxine, is called Fréjus. Mm -hmm. This very city, this very town, this very small place, is living on cork, on making, producing cork. Until nowadays. All right, let's move on. That's one thing that we didn't mention yesterday. Now, we're going to speak about the Ottomans today. First of all, what do you guys know about the Ottomans? Quickly, come on. What do you know about the Ottomans? I want to hear the Arabs and I want to hear all the others. I want you to tell me what is the idea that comes to your mind when you, when I tell you Ottomans, okay? Ottomans. Sorry? The last Islamic caliphate. The last caliphate. The last caliphate, that's right. The last caliphate. Anything else? Sorry? They are warriors and nomads from West Asia. West Asia? Anatolia and Central. 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 Okay. So they came from Central Asia. They were Central Asian people. Turkic people were Central Asian people, yeah? Central Asian people. Very good. Um, did they not burn a lot of Islamic books? They were originally mercenaries and stuff like Very good. They were mercenaries fighting actually for the Muslims, exactly. Mercenaries, right? And originally, okay, they were mercenaries protecting the borders, right? Weren't they? Without the Turks, the Mongols would have invaded Europe and the Muslim world. Next to, uh, they destroyed Baghdad, of course, but they didn't go further. The Turks, the Turkic Mamluks in Egypt, they are also Turkic people, they kept, in the Battle of Al-Ai, Al-Jalut, they kept the Mongols out. So why didn't they protect Baghdad? Sorry? Why didn't they protect Baghdad in Iraq? They were just too strong. Okay, and Baghdad was at its end of its power. It was 1200. There was nothing going on anymore in Baghdad. Okay? But the Mamluks were stronger and they could keep them back. Alright? So Central Asia, anything else, quickly? Ottomans, anything else? Yeah, Egypt. Do we have Arabs here actually next to 
Yeah, no, right. Where are you from? Uh, from Qatar. Qatar, okay. Um, what do you know about Ottoman? Yes, I know about Ottoman. This is came after uh, uh, Spring Road, man. After Abbasid, yeah, yeah. after from, uh, I think, because uh, they're better to call Baramic, I think. Okay, no, no, no. Just give me one, one keyword. I wonder what, what, what do you, if I, if I tell you Ottoman, what do you, what do you imagine? Warriors, yeah? Yes. Okay, warriors, yes. Fighting people, right? Mercenaries, the brother said before, very correct, yes? Yes, sir. Yes. Conquered Constantinople. Constantinople, very good. Great leaders, okay. Okay, great leaders. Anything else? The girls? Before Ottoman, there was six Yeah, Guys, can you, can you wait? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I leave the Seljuks now. What do you know about the Ottomans? I want quickly some keywords. Girls. What comes to you? Mongols, Mongols. What about Mongols? What Mongols? What? Anyway, okay, I just put it on the board. Okay. Mongols, okay. Quickly, anything else? Let's fill the board. Anything else? Other ones? Anything else? That's it? Okay. All right. Let's leave it up to here. Okay. So, now we've got quite some. We have Ottomans, okay. The last Caliphate, Central Asian people, mercenaries, warriors, Constantinople, and Mongols. Now, this is in general all quite positive, except the Mongols, most probably. What do the Mongols have to do with the Turks? With the Ottomans, sorry, Ottomans, I should not use the word Turks yet. Yes? The Golden Horde. Now you're bringing up something else. The Golden Horde was in Russia. Okay, what about them? They were also Mongols, huh? Yeah. Mongolian people. Were the Turks Mongolian people? Okay, now, they also came, the Mongolian people came also from the same area. They came also from Central Asia. And indeed, the Turkic tribes, Turkic tribes, that means all these people who identify themselves who identify themselves with uh, anything Turkish, like the language or culture, these people come originally from Central Asia. Areas like what is nowadays Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, and so on and so on. This is Central Asia. The Caucasus, yeah, yeah. Caucasus is, Caucasus is also in that area. It's a massive area. It's massive. Yeah. It's bigger than the whole of Europe. Uh -huh. Okay. I will show you my picture. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so indeed, the Turks came from there. And they were first mercenaries, and they were actually slaves. You know, the Mamluks. Mamluk means slave. The Mamluks were Turkic people. They were slaves. There is no dynasty in the whole history of humanity. There is no system. There is no people where the slaves work themselves up to become caliphs, or to become kings, or to become rulers. No other one except Islam. In Islam, you will find slaves becoming caliphs, kings, rulers. Yeah. Nowhere else in Buddhism or anything else will you be able to find that. A slave is a slave and will die a slave. And not in Islam. A very important point. Very, very important point. Okay, good. Let's see what we have here now. Okay, the mighty Ottoman Empire, right? Indeed, mighty. Take a look at the, uh, the words again. Let's divide ourselves. Well, how many do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight words, three dates. Eight words. Turks, Suleiman the Magnificent, Selim the Sot, Selim the Grim, Ottoman Greece, the division of Cyprus, Mehmed Fatih the Conqueror, and the Crusades. Can we quickly take a look again on our phones, you know, one group, two, three, three groups divided by eight. It's better to have four groups divided by eight, isn't it? Okay, two words each, right? So the Turks, Suleiman the Magnificent, this group here, okay, take a look at what are Turks, where do they come from, who are the Turks, who is Suleiman the Magnificent, take a look at your phones or laptops or whatever you have. Next group here in the back, up to, let's say, the brother there, right? Or the girls? No, no, no. Second group is here. So we have Selim the Sot and Selim the Grim. Can you check these two sultans? The one is called Selim the Sot and the other one is called Selim the Grim. Girls in the back. 
We take Ottoman Greece and the division of Cyprus, with Nazi together. And the last two, Mehmed Fatih, the conqueror, and the Crusades. Okay? Now, try to also link it up, the Crusades obviously is a massive topic, try to link it up with the Ottomans. Okay? Is it Selim the second? Selim the? The third and Selim the Grim. Yeah, one of them is the second. But you will find, you will find, you will find which one it is. His title is, yeah, yeah, his title is the one is the third and the other one is the Grim. Selim the first and the third, the second, there is no third, no. Selim first and second. Okay? You will find the title when you find the <laughs> One of them, yes. Um, six minutes, right? 48, let's say, after 55 minutes. All right. Ready? Ready like Freddy, come on. Let's get this started. Now, number one, what do we have? The Turks. We, we did make a start already. We talked about the Turks, okay? <coughs> Have you found any, any, anything else about what we said? So the Turks, who are the Turks, where did they come from, who, where, what? The Turks, they're from... Just asking them, I'm sure. Oh, you don't speak English? Yeah. What's the problem? They're from Libya, they're from Libya. Yeah, okay, you too. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. So, listen. No problem. Good, good. All right, uh, yeah, Turks, guys. Yes, Turks are just Okay, just about the Turks. The Turks, where are they from? Who are these people? Just we have to understand what are we talking about. Who are the Turks? So far we call them Turkey, and they, their first minority was the Ottoman Empire. They are the things we call the Turks. Uh, wow. Uh, what is it? Turks were a minority. Yeah. Wow. Okay. What is it? No, no. I heard. Okay. Again. Again. Who are the Turks? Who are these people? We said already before, they came from Central Asia, right? The girls Munira said mentioned before. Munira, right? Yes. Yeah. She mentioned before that they came from Central Asia. Okay, so these are Central Asian peoples. Okay? Peoples with S. Is this like from that somebody called Mamalik age? This is after like a Turkish game? Long before. Long before. Long before. The Turkey people are old people. Yeah, yeah. Long before. So they came from Central Asia. Okay, what is nowadays Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, up to Mongolia, all this area. Okay, all right. And nothing else? You haven't found anything else about the Turks? The largest minorities in Bulgaria. They became Muslim. Yeah, you find, okay, there are minorities of Turks in Bulgaria, in Greece, in Albania, in Bosnia, in Romania. In Romania, why? Because that's where they were, and they had to leave. Accept. Okay. Ottoman Empire. That was actually the biggest dynasty that has ever existed in history, as as we know. It's around. You know, we're talking about a very, very long period of time. It's a dynasty. It's a continuous dynasty. Genghis Khan. It is like part of. Don't mix it up. Wait, 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 wait. Genghis Khan is not a Turk. He was a Mongolian. There are two different people. People who misunderstand this. It's a very important thing to now mis to, 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 to see the misconception, the misunderstanding of people. Okay? So the Turkic people, Turkic tribes, they came from Central Asia all the way up to Mongolia, the border. Uh -huh. But they were not Mongolian people. Yes, yes. No. The Mongolian people came from the same area. Okay? Mongolia nowadays is a country. China came. No, no, China is China. They always fought the Mongolians. But the Mon Mongolia is a country nowadays, but it's a country, as we know, country, a state. But it does not mean that they just were in Mongolia, but now it is Mongolia. Okay? The area was much bigger before. Okay? Yes. And the leader of the Mongolians, the first leader, Genghis Khan, yeah. took Mongolian culture from what is nowadays Mongolia all the way to Hungary. Why is Hungary called Hungary? Do you know? Han, Gary, Attila the Han. Have you heard of Attila the Han? Yeah. Attila was a Central Asian Mongolian. The Hungarian people have Mongolian Central Asian blood. 
the Hungarian language is not a European language, has nothing to do with any other language except with Finnish. The Finnish people are also Central Asian Mongolian people. When the Mongolians came to Europe, they split some state in Hung Hungary, Central uh, uh, Eastern Europe, and some went to Finland. Yeah, Finland. If you pay attention to Finland during the time of, you know, the Cold War, you will see how Finnish people were having every year these beauty contests. Finnish people had to prove to themselves and to the world that they are Scandinavian people, but they are not. So Sweden, Denmark, Norway and Iceland, these are Scandinavian Germanic people. But Finnish people are Central Asian people, originally, originally. They came from Central Asia and they split some state in Hungary and some in Finland. Finnish and Hungarian have the same root. The Finno-Hungarian branch of the language has the same root. Okay? So when somebody, when a Finnish person learns Hungarian, they will be able to learn Hungarian much faster than anybody else, the other way around as well. A Hungarian person will be able to learn Finnish. So the beauty contest during the whole time when they do them was just to prove to the world they would always try to look for the blondest, whitest woman in Finland to make sure that they tell people, listen, we are not Mongolians. You understand? Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm just saying here? Yeah. Why don't they look like Mongolians? Because we're talking about centuries ago. Do the Turks look like Mongolians? Some of them do. Some of them do, yeah. because they're close to the Anatolia. Okay? And it was a massive empire, so many of them, okay? But Finland not. Okay? And, well, people adjust. You know, we adjust, right? Humanity adjusts to their climate zones. Okay? So, Finnish people are actually originally Central Asian people. They hate hearing that. As the Turks hate to hear that they're actually Central Asian people too. The same area where the Mongolians came from, you know? And I like saying that because they don't like hearing that. That's how simple it is, you know? So, it's just simply a fact, you know, if we come to terms with where we come from, who we are originally, then we can move on in history. If not, if we have this inferiority complex, like certain people in certain countries and certain peoples have, then we cannot move on, okay? So now, um, yeah, the Turks from Central Asia, now, um, and they spoke, they speak different Turkic languages, right? So, Suleiman the Magnificent, who was that? In the 15th century, yeah? From the 15th century onwards. Right. Did you hear that? Yeah. 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 For the Ottoman Empire. Excellent, exactly. The peak of the Ottoman Empire was under him. He was the one who actually had the longest under him. It was uh, the, 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 the widest, the, the, the biggest spread of the Ottoman Empire happened under him. Okay, we'll see that inshallah later. Just a quick one. Selim the Sot and was, Selim the Grim. Uh, he was known as Selim the Blonde. He was the son of uh, Suleiman the Magnificent and he ruled from 1566 until his death, which was in 1574. Who was that? That was Selim the Blonde, Selim the, Selim the Sot. Uh, Selim the Sot. What is the other name for him? Selim the Blonde. Selim the Blonde, okay, but what is the. Okay, Selim the Second, right? Yes, yeah, Selim, Selim. He was a Selim II, Selim the Sot. What does it mean, Sot? It's an old word nobody uses nowadays. But people from here who have grown up in this country should know what is Sot it? is. Alcoholic. I don't expect it from you. Huh? Drunk. Alcoholic. Drunkard. Alcoholic. It means the drunkard. Okay? Now, I chose, I chose for him on purpose. Purposely, okay? I chose for him. And we'll discuss this why I chose for him, okay? I chose to show, to present him to you, because he was not the best of all the sultans, but actually he was one of the worst ones. And I want to present him to you next to Suleiman the Magnificent, who was one of the best ones. It's not here. Okay? And it shows you, it shows you what the downfall was of the Ottoman Empire. It shows you the rise and the fall of the Ottomans. Now, I remember once I had an interesting, a very interesting talk in Durban, I think it was in South Africa, I don't remember it was not Durban or Cape Town, one of the cities down in South Africa. And I had some Turks sitting in the classroom, in the lecture theater. And one of them got upset with me 
when I mentioned Selim the Sot. And he said, you should not mention this. You should not say that he was the Sot. I said, uh, that's what he came into history. That's his name in history. So he said, no, we should not call them these names. 35 or 36 rulers of the Ottoman Empire, they should be treated basically, you know, like they're something special. I asked him, were they prophets? That's something that he mentions is when we talk about prophets, right? So are they on the same level like prophets? He could not answer me, of course not. Of course not. If we are dealing with history, then we have to, what did I say before? It's very important to get rid of our inferiority complexes and get rid of our nationality and ethnicity nonsense, you know, and where we come from originally and everything, and then to look into it with open mind, you know, and I always keep saying you have a glass. The glass is half empty or it's half full. But this glass, before you start learning something, empty it first and start filling it then. Everything that you have in mind that you think you know, okay, just leave it aside for the moment and after you have learned what you're learning, put it in there and see if it's true what you have learned and see if it's right what you have learned or if something that came to it, you know, can fill this glass, make it more, more interesting, richer, okay? So, Selim the Sot, the drunkard, yes, Selim the Second. What about the other one, Selim the... But, yeah, this said he was like the host of life. Or they give him the name like this, or he was... Uh, we will speak about him, inshallah. It's just, I, I, we will go into deeper, uh, yes. in the depth of it, inshallah. Okay? okay? So, this title was given to him by the West. Okay? This title was given to him by Western rulers. Okay? Okay. Yes. Selim the Grim, he started the expansion of the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East and Africa. So he, he was Selim the First, yeah? yeah? So Selim the, the Grim is the first one, and Selim the Sot is the second one. So Selim the First was the one who expanded, actually, exactly. He was earlier than him, and he was definitely somebody to look deeper, more deeper than Selim the Sot, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, very good, all right. What about, where are we now? Ottoman Greece and the division of Cyprus girls? Um, okay, so Ottoman Greece. It wasn't fully Greek um, dominated, but it was a multi-ethnic society. Um, so there was Jews, Italians, Armenians, Albanians, um, Gypsies, Bulgarians. So it was like a multi-ethnic society. Okay, you're describing the Ottoman Empire. You're describing then, basically all these Ottoman Islamic Greece. empires. You're, you're right. All these Islamic empires, that's exactly how it was. Now, Ottoman Greece is just an example, which I'm going to use, not because I'm Greek, but because it will play an important role for the Ottomans. And the Ottomans got destroyed from within. And the Greeks played a very important role. Okay? The Ottoman Empire got destroyed from within. And this happened in the 19th century from ideas, nationalist ideas that came from France and especially grabbed the Greeks. Okay? And this is why Ottoman Greece or Greece plays an important role next to all the other countries because the Ottomans did not just open Greece to Islam, but they also went to other countries on the Balkans, and we'll talk about this one also in China. What about, next one, the division of Cyprus, a very important point because this, we're not learning history guys, to learn some dates, and to feel happy about something. We're learning history to, in order, what did we say the first time? One of the points to learn history is to, learn from mistake. to not make the mistake, to learn from the mistakes, what else? Related to nowadays, guys. Yes. Related to nowadays. Now, I have Cyprus there for a reason. Many of you most probably don't even know where Cyprus is. But Cyprus, Almost. as Greece played an important role for the destruction of the Ottoman Empire, yes. Cyprus plays a role until nowadays for what we, how we look at Turks. How we looked and look at Turks. Because Cyprus is a divided island among Turks in the north and Greeks in the south. And it's an independent country. It is not Greece. And I was correctly asked once if I'm Greek from Greece. Yes, I'm Greek from Greece. I'm real Greek. Okay? I'm not Cypriot. So the, the Cypriots, you know, have a common culture and common history with Greece and with Turkey alike. Mm -hmm. Because they're divided among two peoples. Mm -hmm. And these people divided their island between, among themselves after the British left. Okay, Cyprus was once a British colony. Okay? What now? 
Okay. <laughs> um, Mehmed Fatih, the conqueror. Next important sultan. Two sultans are of the most important ones that you should know. You know, I want you to keep some names in mind. I want you to keep some dates in mind. I want you to remember some things out of this here. Okay? I don't expect you to do a PhD in what we're doing here, obviously, as we said already. But there are certain dates, names, capitals, cities that are, you need to know. One of his names is Suleiman the Magnificent, definitely. And another one is Sultan Mehmed Fatih. He was called Fatih because it means what? Open. The opener. What did he open? He opened the beautiful city of Constantinople, which was a Greek Byzantine city before. Okay? And he opened it in 1453. All right? Now, and it became Istanbul. And we'll find out more about him. And the Crusades. Anything else about the Crusades? Or anything at all about the Crusades? Yeah, I believe, uh, Sorry? We had the 1453 like, concept. Oh, Fatih, okay. Okay, the Crusades play an important role because the Crusades, when they started in the 13th century, 14th, that's when the Turkic people, the Seljuks first, the brother mentioned that before, before the Ottomans there was another dynasty, there, another Turkic dynasty as well. They were called Seljuks. Okay? Yes. The Seljuks. And after the Seljuks came the Ottomans. What did we say yesterday? We're talking about dynasties. These are all Muslims, right? We are not talking about different kind of empires, different... These are all Muslim empires, right? Both of them were... And the founders of these dynasties were always different people from different tribes. So, Ottoman, obviously the name comes from the founder was... Uthman. Uthman in Arabic, Osman in Turkish, okay? So he was the founder of the Ottomans, right? Before them the Seljuks, but they never entered Europe. The Seljuks never came to Europe, whereas the Ottomans played a much bigger role and they conquered and opened the Balkan Peninsula up to Hungary. Okay, good. Now, ah, sorry, yeah, and the date, sorry, sorry, that's important. The dates here, 1453 obviously is there. Fatih. Fatih, opening of Constantinople, that's a date you should never forget. We have one date that I told you, you remember, we spoke about 7-Eleven, that's the one day that I definitely need you to remember. Which is what again? 7-Eleven? Tarek bin Ziyad, Gibraltar, Spain. That's the time when the first Muslim entered Europe. From the west. Okay? From the southwest. 7-Eleven. Next one is 732. What is that? Not opened. There was a battle in Tour and Poitiers where the, the French beat the Muslims back. A very important one to remember for us, it was a loss, but that one nowadays is used in France against the Muslims, okay? This number here, 732. Okay? And then, another important one. 1492 or 32. 1453, first of all. 1453 is opening of Constantinople. Constantinople. Opening of Constantinople, Sultan Mehmet Fatih. That's when the Muslims come from the east. Before they came from the southwest, that was the Iberian Peninsula, Spain, Portugal, Italy, and France. Now, other Muslims, not the Arabs. Now it's Turkic people coming from the east, from Central Asia. What Asian is, people. What is Constantinople uh, uh, today? Is, uh, Istanbul. Istanbul. Okay, 1453, opening of Constantinople, becoming Istanbul. And I want to tell you something very nice. Do we have any Turks here? Yeah, Anybody was Turkish? Kurdish. Kurdish. From Turkey? Yeah. Yeah. From Iraq. From Iraq. Okay. Um, the Turks always say, you know, I love it, I love it, I love it. The Turks always say, Istanbul, you know, Constantinople. What is Constantinople? Um, Constantinople, the Emperor Constantine. Who was this emperor? Was the last Roman Christian. The first one, actually. Oh. The first, exactly. Now, Constantine, Constantinople is a city. In Greek, this here comes from polis. Polis means city. 
So the city of Constantine, Constantinos. Constantine was the first Roman, Eastern Roman emperor who, who, who became Christian and put Christianity as the main religion of his empire, of the Eastern Roman, of Roman Empire, actually. Okay? So Constantine. So he called the city Constantinople. Now, the Turks call it nowadays Istanbul. Istanbul. What does this mean? Islam. Linguistically impossible. Linguistically impossible. A T throughout history never changes into L. An N doesn't change into M easily, maybe, but this never happens. Throughout linguistic history, you will never find a T changing into L. How comes Istanbul? All right. Now, Istanbul comes the same, has the same root like Constantinople. It's Greek. It's also Greek, as Greek as anything else is in Constantinople, because the Greeks, until nowadays, they used to say, "Pau Istimbolin, Pau Istimbolin." I'm going to the city. The city was just one and only, the biggest one. Bull is polis. Bull, polis, is, is, tin, means into the city. Istimbolis, istimbolis. The, in Greek, n and p, n and p together makes b. So these two consonants together make a b. So it says istimbolis, Istanbul. And not Islam will and crack. Okay? <laughs> so, no, no, no. This is all, you know, again, it's nationalism, guys. This is all Turkish nationalism. Okay? This is a Greek word, as Greek as Constantinople is. Okay? So, Istanbul is until nowadays, even, you say, Pau Istimboli. Pau Istimboli in modern Greek, right? In, eight, in older Greek, you would say Istimboli. So, Istanbul is as much a Greek word as Constantinople is, as many things are there. Next thing is 1680, actually after 1453, we have another one, 1492. <coughs> what is this? Several important well, issues in 1492. That's when they went to the Ottomans. Who? The yes, Jews. Yeah. Well, even more important, why did they go to the Ottomans? What happened to them? They were getting kicked out by the Christians. So they were getting well, even more important, what happened? How did, what, what, what happened? The end of, uh, the end of, of the end of Al-Andalus, yeah. Granada, the last, the last city, the last Muslim part in Spain, Granada, finished. They lost it. The Muslims lost it. So 1492, Queen Isabella, the Queen and the King of Spain, they opened for themselves Granada. Okay, they signed a treaty, keep the Muslims there, kick out the Jews. And of course, we know also Christopher Columbus. You know, he the man. He arrived in America. <laughs> You know, after everybody had been already there, you know, he discovered for himself America. So that's 1492. And then, what else do we have then after that? There are some other things, but then we have 1683. What is that? We're going to talk about it, inshallah, still, but I'm going to still put it up there. We're going to talk about it later. And of course, 1923. Another important point, maybe you can the imagine what was that? The end of the caliphate, the end of the... The beginning of the Republic of Turkey. The re beginning of the Democratic Republic of Turkey, as they call themselves. Does that mean we will have another caliphate by 2023? Allah alam, you know, I met a Turk who told me, it's very close, next caliphate is coming. So... Is it every 100 years? Is it? Maybe. Maybe. Inshallah. I don't know. I don't know. Inshallah. Inshallah. It would be good to have a caliphate. Okay, so 1923 is the last that we're going to discuss. Inshallah as well. Yeah. Now, who are the Turks? Who are the Ottomans? And where did they come from? Most of these questions were answered. Who are the Turks? You said it already. Turkic peoples, different people, not one. Okay? The Turks are not one people. Nowadays it's one nation, Turkey. But it used to be different Turkic tribes coming from Asia. As we know, everything was tribal before, guys. Even in Europe, tribalistic. Even nowadays, they just call it different. They call it nations nowadays. But they actually, 
very tribal. Everyone. They always keep saying the Africans are tribal and the Asians are tribal and everything else, but actually they themselves are even more tribal. Okay? Well, they just give it another name. So, who are the Ottomans? We said it, the founder was Osman. Osman, where did they come from? From Central Asia. That's the origin of the Turks. So they call the Black Sea or? That's where they come from. Mongolia, you see that? China, East China, which is nowadays still the Uyghurs, you know? The Uyghur Muslims in China, okay? They live in that area. Then Kazakhstan, massive area. You see that that's bigger than Europe. Was this that, is was that called before? What's this area? Central, there is no look. There are different people, different tribes, many thousands of different tribes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, living there. There is no specific. This is, about, this is middle. Uh, Central Asia. Yes. There is no other uh, Central Asia. That's are they cousins to Persians? Persians. Yes, the Persians, especially. Yes, the Persians are. They are not. They are Central Asians, but they are not Turkic people. Okay, but. Turkic people ruled in that area as well. And Persian will play in the Ottoman Empire a more important role than Arabic. Because the official language of the Ottoman Empire was not Turkish, not Arabic, but Persian, Farsi. Okay? And Persian in the whole of Asia plays a more important role than Arabic. Okay? Urdu. What is Urdu? What language? Okay. How did it develop? What does it mean, Urdu? Camp, military camp, that's what it means. And it's a language that developed with, because of trade between Indian, Pakistanis, I mean, there was no Indian, Pakistan, but the, the people in Central Asia. Urdu is actually Turkic. Oh. <laughs> it's Turkish, okay? The word itself is Turkish. It means military camp. Okay? No, it's not a slang. Any language, English, highly civilized language, isn't it? wasn't it like this, that English is a mix, or it's actually a Germanic language. German rule, Germanic language. And the influence that, uh, that the English language had from other languages, you can clearly hear it. There are so many words that they have from Greek, from, from, from Latin, from other languages. Any language is like this. It's just different, it has different stages of development. Okay? There is no language better than another one. No language because it's a newer one or whatever. No language like this. Any language developed the same way. A language is a natural development. A language is not just rules and so that's it. Who develops it? People who speak it. There are more people who speak like English at this moment. English at this moment develops every day in such a fast pace that we cannot cope with it. English teachers, and I am a professional English teacher of the world, English teachers will have to learn every day new words. Every day. The who, dictionary. Who comes up with these words? People. People. <laughs> iPad. <laughs> iPad. Who came up with that? Apple. Exactly. <laughs> Who came up with I'm loving it? Can you say I'm loving in English according to grammar? Can you use ing? You're foreigners, you must have learned the grammar. What about the grammar? You know, present continuous. I am loving, I am doing, I am eating. Can you say I'm loving? According to grammatical strict rules? No. Because love, you cannot conjugate, you cannot put it into present perfect, present continuous, right? You cannot say I'm loving it. But. Who made it? Who made, told you to say it? Wow. McDonald's. That is their invention. Who says to McDonald's, that's wrong English? <laughs> you understand? Okay, so a language develops according to people. It does not get stuck in rules. No language, they are like, you cannot use me like this because I have to stop there somewhere. <laughs> no. Okay? So, the, the people, Turkic people, come from that area, okay? Now, Central Asia. <coughs> Now, the Crusades, as we mentioned before, a very important point, a turning point in the, com the, the, the relationship that the European Christians had with the Muslim world. A turning point. In 1095, Pope Urban, Pope Urban, the Pope of the Christian world that time, came out and said, we have to fight the Turks, and he said clearly Turks, we have to fight the Turks, who are occupying our holy land, Jerusalem. And that's when the whole problem that we have until nowadays starts. What did I say before? We're learning history to understand what is happening around us. We're learning, we, it's not about 1095. 1095 will make you understand what happens in 2014. 
The understanding that we have nowadays, we see the, the hostility and the problems that we face nowadays in certain countries and in certain parts of the world, the, host, the hostility and the, the prejudice that we face as Muslims comes from that time. It comes from 1095. So because that was the first time that Muslims and Christians bounced against each other, okay? Although they were trading before and they were in Spain and everything and they were learning from the Muslims. A Muslim, but until the 11th century, a Muslim was considered something very special. You know, there was a fashion here in London and in Paris. In the 8th, 9th, 10th century, aristocrats, rich people in London and Paris would run around with turbans and with long thobes. Yes! They copied the Muslims in Spain. It was very elegant to be a Muslim. You know, look like an Arab, right? Elegant. So, you go through that city center. No joke, there are drawings from that time that you will find Londoners, you will find aristocrats from Paris walking around in thobes, wrong, long thobes, and with turban. That was fashion, okay? 9th, 10th century, they loved the Muslims. It was something mystic, special. After that, things changed very much. Okay, when the Pope came out and said, they, infidels, kufar, infidels, not exactly the same, but infidels, they came up with this word, infidels, they are the ones who are occupying our holy land. So the first crusade was sent down to Jerusalem. Okay, the first crusade. And here you can see the four big ones. First, second, third and fourth crusade. These crusades, they are important to understand what happened from that time until nowadays, between 1095 and 1289, okay? You see the Seljuk here? The Seljuks, they were there before the Ottomans. The Ottomans came from 1299, okay? 1299, the Seljuks, the, the Seljuks disappear. Yes. The Ottomans come from 1299, that's the Ottomans. Before it was the Seljuks. Before the Seljuks and 1299 Ottomans. Can you tell me that age of uh, Seljuk start when and when? Around the 11th century. No, they were not long. They were not long. They were, that time, around yes. 1000 something. 11th century. 11th century. Until 1299. Two centuries around. Okay? The Seljuks. But they stayed just in Asia. Okay? They didn't come to Europe. All right, now, you remember that yesterday we saw that? The Muslims came to Europe in totally different routes. They came from the south, they came from the west, and they came from the east. From the south and from the west was this year. So, from Africa, who? Tariq bin Ziyad and the Berbers, 7-11, Spain and Portugal, right? The Iberian Peninsula, Al-Andalus. Then, up to 1091, until the 11th century, they stayed in Sicily. Then, this is not here, we know in France also there was a small base, and in Switzerland. And then they moved back, okay, and the Christians come down, and at the same time that the Christians conquer 1492 Granada, this very same time, the Ottomans have come from there already here. They're coming to the, from the east. So, 1492, the Ottomans are already 200 years old. So yesterday I had a conversation, you know, what did the Ottomans do in 1492, where they were very strong? In 1492 it was a strong empire. Why didn't they come to help the brethren in Spain? Why didn't they go to Al-Andalus to help them? Muslims, Muslims, right? Yes. Why not? Because, because of the same reason what's happening today, guys. Who is going to help you? Who, who is helping nowadays Muslims? Is there any Muslim country out there who comes and helps other Muslims? No. Will anybody ever help us if something happens to us here? No. Let's be realistic now, honestly now. Okay, let's not fall asleep. That's why. Yes. Sorry? We don't have ourselves. We don't have ourselves. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. And we don't expect help from anybody else because there is all these useless people out there. Nobody's going to help you. You know, and definitely not these governments nowadays. Okay, definitely not these people. Definitely no, you know, like people believe in Saudi Arabia coming to help you. You know, or the or 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 the or the Arab the Gulf states coming in and helping us. Yeah, if you go go to the Emirates, go and look how they live. Go and look how Arabs live in the Gulf countries. They copy the West more 
than I even know what, how to spell the words. It's unbelievable. It is unbelievable. They have sold their deen already, not only the Gulf Arabs. All Muslims have sold their deen nowadays. You tell them about Islam, and they're like, are you sure you, know, are you, sure you want to be Muslim? <laughs> I was asked by a Muslim when I wanted to say Shahada. I was asked by a Muslim, you know, if I was sure, if it was not a good time, maybe I should think, come back another time. <laughs> <laughs> pathetic. Pathetic. The Muslim world and the Muslims have become as pathetic as you cannot imagine, right? Pathetic. No help at all. When I became Muslim, I had to leave my house. You know, my parents kicked me out. Yeah. All right? I had nowhere to go. And I was living in a city of 100, uh, uh, 30, 40,000, 50,000 Muslims. Okay? Was this in Greece? It was in Germany. Okay, it was in Germany, in the city of Aachen, where we had an Islamic center, where we had, you know, an established, you know, kind of Muslim, you know, whatever, center. And, you know, that was it. And there was no, you know, yeah, you know, we don't want to be in trouble with the law, and, you know, it's maybe better to speak, speak to your father. You're like, my father, keep me out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, maybe, you know, they're not bad people. Right? Do, you know, do I say they're bad people? Is what my parents are saying. I'm saying I need help. I need to stay somewhere. Yeah, you know, maybe you go and speak to your mama. You know the mother, you know how they can be emotional. Yeah, what are you telling me? You're telling me about emotions? Okay? So, pathetic. All right? So if you accept Islam, <coughs> then you accept Islam for Islam. Yeah. And not for a woman, for a man, for the niceness, for the calligraphy. Yeah. You know, I know I know a case in Greece, for example, there was a woman. You know, a Greek woman. She became Muslim, she said, right? So I met her, Salaam Alaikum. Oh, you say Salaam Alaikum, that's nice. <laughs> what else am I going to say? But okay, anyway, Salaam Alaikum. So I said, uh, you became Muslim, that's nice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. What did you like on Islam? You know, the calligraphy, the writing. You know, it's so beautiful. <laughs> I said, do you know Surat Al Fatiha? Huh? Do you know Surat Al Fatiha? Sorry, I don't speak Arabic. That's, that's the state of some Muslims, right? Sorry, I don't speak Arabic. Do you know Surat Al Fatiha? Some Muslim born carrying with Surat Al Fatiha. Yeah, yeah, okay, fine. But she should have gone into this one a little bit deeper, right? The first thing you learn as a Muslim is how to pray. Yes. The first thing you need to make salah is Fatiha. Yes. So that means all this time that you were Muslim, you didn't pray. Right? That's what it means. <laughs> And you like the calligraphy. Yeah, I don't have to be Muslim to like the calligraphy. So, it depends on our niyyah, on our intention, right? Yes. The first hadith in an nabawi is exactly that. Mm -hmm. Okay? In the 40th hadith of an nabawi is exactly that. And this is one of the most important hadith, actually. Not even the most important mm -hmm. hadith in our deen. That, you know, everything is count, it comes according to your niyyah. Everything, yes. yes. everything comes back to your niyyah. Yes. Okay? Okay, so Balkans and Russia, that's where we see the Turks coming in, the Ottomans, okay? That's the Balkan Peninsula, this one here, the Balkans. So countries like Hungary, down, Romania, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia before, Albania, Greece, and Turkey, okay? By the way, Cyprus is here. All right, so, all right, now, this is what you got, I think the papers that you got, right? The copies, everybody got copies? Yes. yes. Okay. Have you got everybody copies? Okay, yeah, yeah, you will. Okay, I don't have any more. Did you give everything? All gone? Okay, just share the ones that you have. Now, this is for you. If you need more, inshallah, you will get them more, inshallah. So, this is the way that we divide it, just to get a general overview. How you divide the Ottoman Empire, okay? You have the rise from 1299 to 1453, but this is just the, the division that I follow, uh, myself and certain other historians, but not all historians agree to the same division, okay? That does not mean that it's, it's not put in stone, okay? You can still change this. But it gives you a general idea. These were the sultans from, Sul from Osman, who was not a sultan, by the way, from Osman I to Murad II. These were the rulers of the Ottoman Empire during the time of the rise from 1299 to 1453, 1453, the opening of Constantinople, of course, okay? Then, you have Sultan Mehmet Fatih, of course, the growth period. 
from 1453 to 1606, that's the growth period, the peak period, okay? Especially under Sultan Mehmed Fatih, Bayazid Selim the first or Suleiman, Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. Suleiman was given the title the Magnificent in English. In Arabic and in Turkey, he's called Al Kanuni because he actually put, changed this, well, he didn't change, but he put the uh, system, ne jurisdiction. the jurisdiction, right? Now, he ch the sh there is no, nobody has to change the Islamic system, I mean, the Sharia, clear, but what he did, <clears throat> well, the law was there, the law was there, but what he did, he did, um, he, he, he did put into the existing Sharia law, which has been there for all the uh, centuries, he actually added, you know, um, the Ottomans like type, type of law as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but you know, the policy or the yeah, he he he, 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 no, uh, you can't change Sharia, 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 yes. but he did next to Sharia. Okay, there were other laws that counted for the Ottomans. Yes. He integrated. He integrated Sharia law in the Ottoman, if you want to say. It. We can't say integration. If you say integrate, then you change. Yes, exactly. Kanun. Kanun. Like what Nabilion? Like what Nabilion then? Like. Yeah, but he did. He did. He did not use the whole Sharia. Let's put it that way. Yes. I don't want to say something wrong. You know, he ha he used Sharia, but he did not follow the Sharia entirely. Yes. Okay. Half Muslim. <laughs> it's like half pregnant. I had a friend who was saying, "Are you pregnant? Are you not pregnant? Half pregnant or not pregnant? Are you pregnant?" You don't understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm trying to. I'm trying to make myself. Example, it, what, he did not use the fully Sharia law. Yes. Okay, so and that's why it was called Al Kanuni because he actually certain laws. Not necessarily that he changed the Sharia, but with what he did, he added some things to the Sharia that were not there before. Yes. But did they contradict the Sharia? Not necessarily. I mean, it doesn't go too deep into this. I don't, uh, you know. Yeah. Some of the laws he said, like the color of the turbans that Jews should wear. Thank you. Like, for example, so for example, so, for yeah. example. Yes, very good. Exactly. That's a very good. The clothing restrictions. Yeah. Now, he was the one, indeed, the very important point for us to know. He was the one who actually said that when you, you can, Jews cannot ride horses. Jews were not allowed to ride horses. Jews were not allowed to wear certain type of clothes. Christians are not allowed to wear certain type of clothes. A Muslim is the only one who was, wear, was supposed to wear turban and the certain colors of the turban. Who is that? Who is that? He actually institutionalized the idea that we have nowadays in the whole Muslim world, especially in Turkey, of the Imam being actually nothing else but a priest. So, now, the deeper I go into it, the more I don't want to give too much of my opinion about this one. But, you know, it was not entirely the Sharia as was in existence before him. He didn't have to rewrite the Sharia. He didn't have to put anything else but the Sharia. Okay? He didn't have to do anything. It was there before him already. The Umayyads existed before him. The Abbasids existed before him. The Seljuks existed before him. The Ottomans before him existed also before him. So they were also ruling according to something. Right? Okay? But he did the lawgiver. He did do something extra to the law. Okay? All right. Okay, let's leave it like this there. Right, so, stagnation. That's a very important different period, 1606 to 1699, the 17th century. The stagnation starts, according to certain historians. Not Ottoman historians, not Turks. When you tell them stagnation, they get a heart attack. There is no stagnation, according to them. The decline starts in 1699 to 1808. Again, they say there is no decline because some sultans in between, in this period of decline, were better than others. For example, Sultan Ahmed III. For example, Sultan Abdul Hamid. For example, Sultan Osman III. These were stronger rulers, some of them at least. They were stronger rulers. So they say there is no period of decline. But in general, we use that one like this. And the last one is the period of Tanzimat and dissolution from 1808 <coughs> to 1922. That's when everything went definitely downhill. That's when nationalism came, entered the Ottoman Empire. That's when the minorities in the Ottoman Empire, the Christians, especially the Greeks, that's when they got influence from outside ideas. 18, 
Eight, in the 1800s, when was the French Revolution? Another important date. French Revolution was in 1789. That's another important date because from 1789 on, the French revolutionary ideas about nationalism came into the rest of the world. The Statue of Liberty in New York, you know who gave it to them? The French. The French shipped it over to America. They saw the Americans as their friends that time because the enemies of the Americans was that time the British. They fought for independence. So the French, you know, your, how is it again? Your, your enemy's friend is my friend. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Very good, exactly. So that's what the French did that time, right? And they always ruled like this until nowadays. Okay? Very strong like this. Where is the, the, the British divide? Divide and rule. Okay? So, good. So this, you have it in front of you, okay? Just to give you a general idea. Where do you think is this? It's a little bit blurry, but where do you think is this? Turkey. Because it's a bazaar, right? Turkey. Turkey, okay. Any other idea? Uh, it's, I think, in Bosnia or something. Munira, you really know too much, you know? <laughs> it really disturbs me. <laughs> You're very close to it, indeed. It is not Turkey. Where else? It's Spain. Is it? Baghdad. Spain. No, it's not Spain. Baghdad, Baghdad okay. India. Now, it is in the Balkans. It is indeed, you know, the girl said Sarajevo, it's very close, it's Athens. It's Athens, the capital of Greece. Okay? Where is it? Athens, the capital of Greece. There used to be, this is Monastiraki. Monastiraki is the area where you have to walk to go to the Acropolis, the Parthenon. You cannot see it up here, but this one is the Parthenon. The Acropolis. You all know what the Acropolis is, hopefully, right? The Acropolis, right? The Parthenon, the Temple of Parthenon. Wherever you go in Athens, you see the temple in front of you, right? This is the, the, the symbol of civilization, the symbol of ancient Greece, the symbol of democracy, the symbol of anything that represents Europe at this moment. What is this okay? year? This was in the 12th century. Uh, no, sorry, what I was saying. 15th century. 15th century Athens. Yeah. Okay? Now, imagine Athens. These people are not all Muslims. Okay, they might be dressed like ones, like Muslims, like Muslims, but they're not. Greeks, Greek women, until my grandmother died, my grandmother was wearing a black hijab, was was dressed in black. If you go to Spain, to Italy, to Portugal, and you go to our villages, you will find all our old and grand, all, all our grandmothers, they're all dressed in black, all with hijab. Yes. And my grandmother will never forget, really, subhanAllah. I will never forget when, um, you know, when she, 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 when, they went, when she was in her room and uh, somebody would come, the door was locked, closed, of course, and before she would come out, she would always wear hijab, like a Muslim, Muslim woman, you know, like, yes. you know, my wife nowadays, you know, it was like, totally hijab and go out. She would never go out without hijab. Mm -hmm. SubhanAllah. And we were always saying, you know, like, Gren, what are you wearing? Your hijab? What is this? You know, why are you wearing this thing? And my mother would say to her always, come on, what are you wearing this thing for, you know? So. There's some English women who wear hijab as well sometimes. Well, it was, you know look, it was, a, it, it, it's a, it was a type of modesty for anybody before. Mm, yes. Nowadays it has become something to curse on because of the Muslims. But nuns <coughs> wear hijab. Okay? Why do they wear it then in the monasteries? Okay? So it's a type, it's a modesty, cloth of modesty, right? right? So people copied the Muslims. Okay? Now, <laughs> we're now talking about the Balkan countries, okay? This is the Balkan countries. We're talking about countries like Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, which used to be Yugoslavia all before, right? These countries that have become seven independent countries nowadays. Albania, Greece, and Turkey, okay? This is the Balkan Peninsula. Balkan Peninsula. The Balkan Peninsula plays a very important role in the development of the Ottoman Empire because that's when the revolution start, that's when the Ottoman Empire will go down and that's when they will leave their traces behind. We have nowadays in the whole of the Balkan Empire, the Balkan uh, Peninsula, we have a lot of traces from the Ottoman Empire. In Greece alone we have more than 200 um, Ottoman monuments. You know, there's still one DVD, whoever's interested, I got my DVDs here. Still one. The books are gone. I will take them back in, in January, right? In January we'll be back. 
no, about Ottoman monuments in Greece. It's still, still one DVD is here. And Ottoman, uh, Ottoman Hungary and Vienna, Austria. They went up to Vienna, up to Austria. Look, Austria. Austria is here, up here. Vienna is here. That used to be an empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire. And this is when we come to 1693. That's when the Turks, the Ottomans, were standing at the gate of Vienna. Vienna, Austria. And the German-speaking Austrians and Germans were shivering. They thought that was it. That's it for us. That's it. The Turks are coming. They started ringing the bells of the churches. Until nowadays in this country as well, there is a specific time and day when they keep this tradition up. Not on a Sunday, but there is a Friday, I think it was, when you will hear the church bells ringing. In certain areas, still they keep it up. In this country, in, Europe, in the rest of Europe. That comes from that time. The Turks were in front of Vienna, so they asked God, you know, to forgive their sins and to help them to go through this plague. Okay? So, imagine, look how important the understanding from that time is nowadays. There are still nowadays, in this country, in Britain, certain parishes, certain churches, certain areas where they ring the bells, I think on a Friday, midday, they ring, it. they keep the tradition, you know, many of them don't even know if you ask them why they do it. They just do it. It's a traditional thing. It came from that time. Okay, so the Ottoman Empire, look how big it was, look Vienna, look Vienna, Austria, Austria. So the Muslims came from the south all the way to Paris, Italy, Switzerland, and from the west they came to Austria. So Austria and Switzerland, these are border nations. Basically they came into Central Europe, you know, they came into Central Europe. And the fear that the Muslims grabbed on the one side, the uh, non-Muslims grabbed on this side, grabbed them here. And the most important thing is, the Byzantine Empire was lost. Constantinople, 1453, became part of the Muslim world. The Orthodox Church and the Orthodox people, all of them became subjects of the Ottoman Empire, right? All of them. So, until nowadays, if you look at it carefully, you will understand, hopefully, why the Orthodox people, the Greeks, the Russians, the Serbs, the Bulgarians, the Romanians, the Albanians, the Christian Albanians, why they hate and they call the Muslims Turks. Okay? They call the Muslims Turks. The war in Bosnia was nothing else but going back to them. That's what the war in Bosnia was about. They used to call the Muslims Turks, go back to Turkey. What's Turkey, Habibi? They don't speak Turkish, nothing. What are you talking about, Turks? When I became Muslim, they called me Turk. Okay, it's still in Greece nowadays, you know? So, this is a very important turning point here. There is, by the way, a saying also in English. In English, they used to say in the 15th, 16th century, somebody who becomes Muslim, it happened, by the way, English people who became Muslim, especially in North Africa, they used to say, they turned Turk. Turn Turk. That's exactly what I'm saying in Greek stuff. Okay? Turn Turk. Not become Muslim, but turn Turk. Okay? So, this is 1683. This is in the middle of Austria, taken out of the documentary again, from Watch Mama documentary, right? So, in Vienna. This, you will find in Vienna more than 200 monuments, 189, uh, 80-something monuments that indicate that the Ottomans were in Vienna, okay? You will either see, you know, um, uh, monuments like this, which tell you that, the, that there was a fight that happened here, okay, in 1683, they met the Christian army there and were beaten. In Vienna, that's how far the Turks were. The Ottomans had already ended in the center of Vienna. And I've been through this route, it's amazing. And Vienna is a beautiful city. I mean, honestly, I'm not so much into Europe, but if I say that Vienna is beautiful in Austria and Switzerland, then believe me, it is. It really is. And I can understand why the Turks wanted to stay there. It's beautiful. All right? Now, the Balkans, as we said before, now that gives you a much better idea. Greece, because it's part of the European Union, and because it's part of the Mediterranean Sea, Many people do not consider it a Balkan country anymore. But the Balkan countries are mainly these ones here. Romania, Bulgaria, and then these ones that used to be Yugoslavia before. You see that? 
That all used to be Yugoslavia before. So now these are countries like Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia, Montenegro, Kosovo, and this is wrong here, it should say FIRO, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. Not Macedonia. Macedonia is a is all this used to be Macedonia before. Greece, this part, all this is Macedonia. So this independent country is called former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, FIRO, and Albania. Okay? All this used to be part of the Ottoman Empire up to Hungary. Hungary is not Balkan. Hungary is Central Europe. Okay? Hungary was 150 years part of the Ottoman Empire. And if you go to Hungary, that's my other documentary, if you go to Hungary, you will still find the tomb of Gül Baba. Gül Baba was the first general who entered Budapest. Okay? If you go to Budapest, you will see his tomb, you will see still a lot of monuments. The culture in Hungary, the spa culture, bath culture, have you heard of this, the hot, uh, the hot baths? In, in Hungary, they attract tourists like this. That comes from the Ottoman Empire. Okay? Right. Now, this one here, whoever can learn, can anybody read this? This one is German. It's in Austria, right? It's in Vienna. It's in the center of Vienna. It's a gate. This represents a Turk. And this here says, Türkenschanzstraße. Türkenschanzstraße. This is the street of the Turks. Mm -hmm. There are many streets in Vienna that have the name Turkan Street, Turkan this, Turkan that, indicating that the Turks were there. Okay? The idea that people had about the Turks, that's why I asked you at the beginning, even if we are Muslims, still, especially Muslims from certain areas, from the Balkan or Arabs, we all have a misconception of the Ottoman Empire. We have a misconception. All this is fueled by education systems in our countries. The Greeks grow up, you know, with being told that these Ottomans were actually nothing else but savages. What do you do if you want people to hate people? If, exactly. You make them look like beasts. Actually, you animalize them. You animalize them. That means you take the ability of being humans, you take it away and you make them on the same level like animals. So you take the ability, you actually take away that somebody's a human. How did they justify, we spoke about it on Monday, how did they justify that you can use Africans as slaves? No soul. That means they're not people. That means they animalize them. They took away the ability, they're, they're what they are. They changed their nature in Greece. It still exists. Okay? So, that's what they do. They want you to believe that these people were bad, so make them bad. Okay? Now, you have the periods in front of you of the different uh, uh, sultans, but we're not going to speak about all the sultans, of course. But, I want to mention some of them that are important. There's the, the first person, of course, who established the Ottoman Empire, Osman Ghazi. The name, of course, the title, Ghazi. Ghazwa. What is Ghazwa? Ghazi? What does it mean? Yeah, jihad, right? Yeah. Is it a battle without the prophet? Sorry? A battle, is it battle Ghazwa. without the prophet? Yeah, actually, yeah. This, one, this, yeah, this fighting for Islam. Okay? Fighting for Islam. That's what it means. Okay, so basically, these warriors, as we said before, you mentioned before, they were known for being strong warriors, for being mercenaries, right? They were, work, they were fighting for Islam, in the name of Islam. These Turks became Muslim on their way from Central Asia, coming to what is nowadays Turkey. They met a lot of these Sufi teachers that were walking around in Central Asia. They were making da'wah. And this attracted the Turks, the Turkic people, and accepted Islam. So from the very beginning, they accepted a type of Sufi Islam. I want this to be clear here. They did not, from the beginning, have the understanding of Islam, you know, in the way of, you know, going back to the roots of, you know, Rasulullah Sallallahu and Khilaf al and everything, but it was a Sufi Islam. And until nowadays, the Islam practiced in Turkey and in the Asia, in many parts of Asia, is actually a Sufi Islam. Okay? Sufism. So, the, his son, Orhan, he was the one who opened Bursa. Bursa, big city, the first Ottoman capital out of three. Bursa 
Edirne, Istanbul. Now, um, Osman Ghazi, Orhan Ghazi, his son. Sorry? They're all the same. Yeah, do they? <laughs> okay. So Orhan was married, by the way, from that time on, something very important. Something very important to, 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 for us to realize. Orhan was married to a Greek lady, Nilo Faratun, who accepted Islam, and she gave him Sultan Murat. So now, according to our constitution, according to the Greek constitution, any little blood, any drop of blood, you know, in your family, if I marry, you know, a non-Muslim, non-Greek, non my children are Greek automatically, according to our constitution. Now, if I now go back and I put the constitution on it, you know, we don't have Turks here, right? Don't kill me. Okay. <laughs> so, Murad the first, he has his mother was Greek, as were other six sultans, by the way. Okay, from that time on, most of the mothers were actually not Turkish, if not even all of them. Okay. Roxelana was Russian, okay, and she gave later birth to other sultans. Now, and so on and so on. So, Sultan Bayezid the first, and then the Interregnum, 1402 to 1413, a very important time again. During this period, Timur Lane, Mongolian comes into the game. Timur Lane was a Mongolian warlord who actually came to conquer the Ottoman Empire. And the Europeans said, no problem, they take care of themselves. The Ottomans are done. But what happens, indeed, he did fight the Ottomans, and he did win, but after them, when basically Mehmed Chalabi becomes 1413, he is a re-founder of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire becomes even stronger, no? So then, Mehmed Chalabi. Uh, is the famous, he was the fast, like, yeah, that's right. He was called the Thunderbolt. That's right. Yes. He was very fast speed. Okay. Now, Mehmed Chalabi is the found, the refound, the second founder of the Ottoman Empire. He puts the Ottoman Empire even stronger on the map. Okay. So the Europeans start shivering again. Okay. There's Bursa. That's the tomb of Muhammad, the Mehmed Ch uh, Sultan Chalabi. It's Mosul. Where is that? Bursa, the city of Bursa. Okay. Now, this one is Murat Koja. Anyway, we're going quickly through them. We don't have time for all of them. Important is Selim the Grim, number nine. Selim the Grim, under him, the conquest of Egypt, fine. But why was he called the Grim? Miserable. Why was he called the Grim? It's a, it's, a, it's a name that was given to him by the Westerners, okay? He was not called the Grim in Turkish or in Arabic. Because he was conquering. What did he do? Right, he fought the Shia, but why? That's not a reason for the Westerners to call him the Grim. Why did the Europeans call him the Grim? What do you think? Because he's coming to their territory, maybe? He wasn't listening to them. Well, he, they were saying that he was persecuting Christians. That's another bull again, okay? That's not true at all. He persecuted, in a specific time period, a specific group who went against the contract. Like Rasulullah kicked out certain Jew, a Jewish tribe from Medina, right? Which they make use of nowadays. What happened? It was not that it was the Jews who had a problem with, but it was a specific tribe that went against the contract, right? Yes. So we cannot say that because there were Jews, he did it, as we cannot say because there were Christians he was ruling, he did it because then he would have to get rid of the whole Balkan Christians. The Balkan Peninsula, until nowadays, a majority Christians, even under Ottoman rule, the majority were Christians. So, how can you in your right mind think that this man had a problem with Christians? He would have had a problem with the whole world. So, they called him the Grim. This is not true. The Grim is a title which is not correct. He did not persecute Christians because they were Christians. He persecuted a specific, a specific, he persecuted a specific group of Christians, right? Okay? Because of them going against him. The other one, Selim the Sot, the drunkard. Now listen. The man indeed drank. He drank wine. He loved Balkan wine. He loved wine. But as 
all of you here, you're all born Muslims, aren't you? Anybody in New Revert? No Revert. All of you born Muslims, I guess. I guess. As in your time period, you were not all angels, and you were not all practicing Muslims. There was a time for Sultan Selim to drink and not following Islam. But there was a time when he made Tawbah and he stopped drinking. Now, anybody who studies medicine here? Anybody who's a pharmacy or something? What happens? What happens when you stop drinking after you have been drinking all your life? You suddenly stop drinking from one moment to the next. What happens to you? Any idea? I'm not. Uh, I'm not a medical. I'm not a medical doctor, so I don't know about this stuff. But I found out because it was important to me to know. For, for me to know, I found out that they have withdrawal symptoms. That there are problems that these people cannot cope with. Stopping from one day to the other, another is not advised. He was advised by his advisors not to do it. But he said, no, Allah forbids it. Allah forbids alcohol. I cannot go on like this. I'm the Sultan. I'm, 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 the, I'm, I'm ruling such an empire. I cannot do that. I cannot do that. So he stopped. And within no time, he died. Short, with the... short time. Okay? Within a very short time, he died. And then he was called Selim the Sot. Wrong title. He died because of giving up what he was actually. He used to be a Sot, but he gave it up. So now we have to understand this carefully you now. We have to understand. There were many mistakes, there were many problems with the Ottoman Empire. There were many Ottoman rulers that were not following the Sunnah. There were many Ottoman rulers who were not following the Sharia. There were many Ottoman rulers who were not even close to Islam. But certain Ottoman rulers were given wrong names and wrong titles. And this is one of them. We have to understand that, of course, as you will all most probably understand, you know, come on. You know, many of you come from the Muslim world, come over here, see all this freedom here, see all these girls running around, right? And go crazy. Let's be honest now. That's how it is. All right? So now, how can you, you know what I'm talking about, right? How can you now have a problem with people doing the same in the past? Yes. So we have no right. We have no right to go and, you know, make up things. So, Selim the Sot, that's this issue. Mehmet Fatih, mashallah, this is Sultan Mehmet Fatih, one of the biggest, you know, Ottoman. He is the one who fulfilled the hadith. You know, the hadith that says, let me find the exact words, Prophet Muhammad sallam, says, that's the, the, the translation in English, you shall certainly conquer Constantinople. What a wonderful leader his leader will be, and what a wonderful army that army will be. And that was the man. That was the man <coughs> who conquered, who opened, not conquered, who opened Constantinople and made it what it is now, <coughs> it is Istanbul now, is a massive city, full rich of history, absolutely amazing, all right? Now, Sultan Fatih Mosque, Suleiman the Magnificent, in his, peak, in his time, that was the peak of the Ottoman Empire, 1520, 1566, all right? Okay, now, uh, another issue here quickly is this one here, Ibrahim the Mat. Another guy is called Ibrahim the Mat. The person was indeed mad. There was a system in the Ottoman Empire where they used to, when you go to the Top Kapi Palace, I don't know if you've ever been to Istanbul, you go to the Top Kapi Sarai, Top Kapi Palace, what did you see there? Okay, what about the golden cage? Okay, there was a golden cage in there, in the palace. And first, they used to kill their brothers. Then the system turned like this, that they would put their brothers in this golden cage, and they were not allowed to leave. Sultan Ibrahim the Mad was put in this cage for all his life. And then they came to pick him up, and told him, listen, you're going to rule now, because your brother Murad died. He said, no, 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 no. Murat, Murat, no, no, Murat's not dead. He said, yes, Murat is dead. You come now, you're the next. So imagine now, this person, there was something wrong with him. He could not. That was a system. Before, they used to kill the brothers. Because they wanted to give the throne for themselves, or they wanted to just give it to their sons and not to the brothers. 
because the system had changed, you know, I don't know who, who put the system, I don't know exactly when it started, but it started after this, the first sultan who came up with this said, no, 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 I'm not going to kill my brother, but I'm going to put him away. So I'm going to put him in these cages. So from that time on, the others followed. So his son followed and put his brother, and so on and so on. Okay? So that was a new system. The system first was killing my brother, the next system was putting them in cage. Okay? But Orhan, something very important to mention, Orhan of Osman, the second ruler, the first uh, Ottoman uh, caliph, he told his brother al Aydin, he said, listen, let's split the, the empire. You take this part, I take this part. SubhanAllah, that was Orhan. That was the first two guys, Osman and Orhan. After this, forget it. Okay? They would start killing each other. And then they came to the cage issue. Okay? So that's why you have to understand some of the Uthmani rulers were not right. Okay? They had no, because they were just the sons or the brothers of, 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 the, previous, of the predecessors, does not make them capable to rule. They could not rule. Some of them were not capable to rule. Okay? Now this is Sultan Mehmed Fatih's tomb. Okay? In Fatih, Istanbul. Um, okay? Now, there is not a lot to mention about these ones here. Now, as we know before, the image of the Turks from the 18th century on the image of the fearful and invincible Turk is exchanged with the ridiculous sick man of Europe, who has lost his previous might and power. The Turks have weaknesses and are not invincible. They start losing control over the subjects and the European powers interfere heavily into Ottoman affairs. From that time on, Russia comes down they lose battles with Russia, or before they would all win. The French come in, the British come in, the Germans come in. Everybody has an influence in the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans change the perspective of the world. They change their clothes. Very important thing. Look at this. There was, first they were wearing turbans, yes. beards, thopes. Yes. Suddenly, they start looking like French people. Yes. French military army. They would wear... You know, they would not wear um, uh, sultan, uh, they would not wear uh, turbans anymore. They would wear, you know, these color-like things, you know, like the French used to wear in the 18th century. That shows you already the change. They used to have advisors coming from France over to advise their, 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 their army. Yeah. Yeah. They buy women as well from the West. So Did they do what? They buy, uh, buy women. You mean slavery? No. Slave. So is that slave. why they have like blonde, blonde uh, girls and blue eyes as well? No, no. Know. First of all, there are many Kurds in Turkey, as you know. And the yeah, Kurdish people, or the original yeah. people, are actually blonder and, and, and blue-eyed than the, 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 the uh, Turks are. Mm -hmm. But I've read somewhere that they bought these, you know, women... They are, yes, they the wore on, on, the, on, on, the, on, the, on their bazaars, yes. They're, especially in Tunisia and Algeria, okay, the Ottomans, and not only them, but also before, the Umayyads as well, they would sell, not only women, they would sell slaves. Is that allowed? Uh, slavery is allowed in Islam until nowadays. So, if you take care of your slave, the way you should, then there's nothing wrong with it. Okay? So, slaves were made because they were prisoners of war. Okay? In the case of the women, the women were the ones who had lost their husbands in the war. What do you do with them? Well, they sold them. Who makes Maybe them money? Well, yeah, they could marry them, of course, yes. Why right, the women don't want to get married? Why? The women are always like. Of yeah. Maybe they didn't want to marry, get married again. No, 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 but this all happened. It happened. Some of them got married to them. Some of them did take them as their slaves, as their concubines, because you can have as a man as many concubines as you want to. Right? In Islam. All right? So, but without misunderstanding it, not what is happening in certain countries, right? Sexual intimacy. Yes, you can. But you have to marry them. No. You have to give them a All right. And you don't have to marry them. Look. Okay, listen. Listen, listen, listen. Just a quick, 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 very quick, listen, very quick. Slavery was something that existed from ancient times. And slavery existed now as Islam. Islam came to abolish slavery as well. Why do you think when you, for example, when you miss your day of fasting or whatever, one of the most important things that you can do is actually freeing your slaves if you have ones, okay? Now. So, slavery is something that Islam is trying to get rid of. But you cannot get rid of a system which was strongly, there was a system there from one day to the other. So it was slowly, it was there, and every time that there was something that you could expiate your sins, you can slave free a slave. So from Islamic point of view, freeing a slave is a very big thing. Right? Okay.
So now, with regards to having, being married as a man, you're allowed, as we all know, to marry up to four wives. You can have as a man four wives, right? Yes. No doubt with this, about this one. It's sitting in the Quran here. Yeah, it's talking. The Quran starts talking about two, three, and four, not one, two. Three. If you can't do justice, marry only one. Right. Good. Okay. Now, so up to four wives. Can you have concubines? Can you have slaves at home or other women that you can have them at home and you can also use them for sexual intercourse? Slaves? Yes, you can. As many as you want. You can, there's nothing wrong with it. Are you sure about this? I'm very sure. Harun al-Rashid. Harun al-Rashid, okay, let's do People make mistakes, okay. That's right, but okay, you can say there was a ruler, he made write something, okay. But there is nothing wrong. You mean you can say. Stop, let's try to say. So if you're rich, you just have a lot of space then. Listen, listen, listen. Uh, what did I say before? What did I, what did I say before? What did I say before? Yeah. What did I say before? Listen, listen, listen. Brother, listen. Brother, brother, listen. Quick, quick, quick. Because sorry, I didn't pass. You made a good point there. Look, look, look. Very important. What did I say before? You take your cup and you empty it. You learn and then you put everything else that you know to it and you find out. You know? you As I said, you're not going to do a PhD. Now, with regards to where you come from and what your background is and what your, your influences is and, so, and so on, this is something that you have to deal with as an individual. Okay? But as a Muslim, where I come from, if I wanted to deal the way that you're just saying that we have to deal with, then I would have never become Muslim. You understand what I'm saying? We have to have an empty cup in order to be able to fill it first. You know? <laughs> so now, when we start new, or when we start looking into certain issues, always go back to the sources. It's not something that I say is right. I don't say it because I believe in it, or I say it, or I made it up. Okay? Now, you can look it up. You can find out if it's like that. You can. Everything is there. Everything is there. And because we don't practice it in certain regions, that's another issue. But in the Gulf, the Gulf Arabs, and I don't know any Emirat who doesn't have less than four women. I know not. <laughs> Qatar probably... How many wives do you have? You know that? <laughs> Come on. I don't know any Emirati who doesn't have less than four women. All of them have four wives. All right? So, but you go to Turkey, none of them has more, uh, more than one. The, the, the Turkish woman would kill you. One woman getting a second wife, she kills you first. So it's, it's a traditional thing, but it's not an Islamic thing. Not to, not to have it. Okay. Um, quickly, because, wow, we're running really out of time. The negative image of the Turks remains in Europe. Now, as we mentioned before, after the French Revolution, nationalism comes into the mind of people, especially the Christians, the subjects of the Ottoman Empire. Suddenly, Russians become nationalists, and they want to support their Orthodox brethren. Suddenly, they feel something for the Greek Orthodox people. The Europeans, the French, the British, the Germans, they start looking back to their ancient roots. So suddenly, they find out, hey, there is a Greek people down there. They're all enslaved by the Ottomans. They have been enslaved for 500 years, but now, they discover them again and say, no, we have to help them out of there. We have to fight the Turkish beasts. So now we have to give them the possibility to fight their way out of this Ottoman yoke, as they called it. And that's what they did. In 1821 was a big Greek revolution, 1821, and that's when the Ottoman Empire lost most of its stronghold. This is in Vienna. In front of the church of St. Steph Stephen, Stephan's Dome, in Vienna, in the center of Vienna. This symbolizes a Christian knight, right? This is a Janissar, a Turkish Ottoman Janissar. And these are, of course, the angels and the halo around him because he was killing the Turks. All right? So from that time on, a good Christian fights any Muslim, especially a Turk. And that's why nowadays, if you speak to many people in Europe, being a Muslim is actually being a Turk. Many people. In this country, not because of the Pakistan and Indian issue. Because they were India. But hadn't they been in India, it was actually, it would mean for them the same like the Germans, or Austrians, or Swiss. Okay? So, <clears throat> after the opening of Constantinople 1453, there were no massacres, but Christians could remain away even protected. The myths that are going around, there are many myths, and we're not going into all of them. There are myths going around that when Sultan Mehmed Fatih entered Constantinople, he went around on a rampage killing people, killing women, innocent children. This is a myth. 
the first thing that Sultan Mehmed Fatih did according to accurate sources was riding into Constantinople, going to the Hagia Sophia, you know the holy, the Hagia Sophia, you know the, the, the church which became a mosque and is now a museum. Okay, so this, this church, cathedral of, of, of Constantinople, he stopped there and he made Turakas. Okay, that's what Sultan Mehmed Fadi did, according to any authentic sources. And not emotional rounds from the Bible, like how people are Greeks. So he did not kill any women and innocent children or whatever. In the contrary, he allowed them all to stay there where they were. Sanctuary, the church was a sanctuary. They were all allowed to go back to their homes. They were all allowed to start a new life in a new city, in a new empire. Actually, they needed people. Constantinople was bleeding. There was nearly nobody there anymore. The men had died, most of them. So, they needed people. And the best that could happen was to him, 1492. What happened, 1492? He told the Jews, come. We need people in Constantinople. And if you go nowadays to Constantinople, you go to the bazaar, you hear Spanish. You hear Jewish people speaking ancient Spanish. It's an amazing situation for a linguist. I've done Spanish linguistics. And the Spanish that they speak there is the old Spanish from the 15th century, ladies and gentlemen. The Jews in the bazaars speak old Spanish still. They're called Sephardat, people from Spain. Okay? Amazing. Rich them. So, this was managed to be kept alive simply because they were not recorded, nothing. So we know now how the Spanish of the 15th century were speaking because of the Jews in Constantinople. That's, that's a, you know, it's a treasure for a linguist, okay? It's fantastic, it's amazing. So, both Uthman and Orhan were known for their tolerance towards the Ahl al-Kitab, and Christians would even find refuge in the Ottoman Empire and would pay less taxes than under the Byzantines. There was even a revival of Arab and Orthodox Christianity. The Orthodox Millet was united under the Greek-speaking episcop with own rules and regulations. The episcop is the equivalent pope for the Orthodox. All religious minorities had autonomy in religious matters, judicial, cultural, and health affairs. That made the religious leaders being second in power after the Sultan, ladies and gentlemen. The Greek Orthodox Church had powers which they would love to have today, and they were actually against the revolution. Listen to that. When the Greek peasant said, we are going to revolt against the Ottomans, the Greek Orthodox Church said, no, what are you talking about? The only one I have to fear is the Sultan. I am your boss. The Episcop, the church leaders, the Orthodox Church leaders had so many rights, which they knew they wouldn't get from the Greeks later once they had an independent state. And that's true, because it became a, Greeks, it became a country, democratic principles, secular principles according to the French Revolution. So the church lost its rights that it had, many rights that it had during the Ottoman Empire. So for the church, it was a loss to actually become independent, to lose the Ottoman Empire. Do you understand that? Man, you're early, man. You start in January. All right? So did you understand this? A very important point, OK? Now. As we mentioned before, selling the grapes, selling the salt, all this is not true, we know that. Now, do you understand what happened in the Bosnian War? After all this, do you understand why people in the Balkans call Muslims Turks? Do you understand why they hate Muslims? Because they are told all these myths, which is not true, of course, it's a myth. Because they are told that these Turks came and raped your women, killed your children, and hated you because you were Christians. Now, 1992, now, Bebek, the Christians are strong, the Serbs are there, the Muslims, nobody. What did we do to them? We get rid of them, as many as possible, because we couldn't do it before. Bosnia, or Yugoslavia, couldn't do that what Greece and Turkey did in 1923. When Turkey was established in 1923, the first thing that they did was the president of Turkey, Mustafa Kemal Atashirk, Ataturk, sorry, <laughs> and Venizelos in Greece, they signed a contract. And the contract said, let's exchange populations. So 
the Greeks said, okay, I will send you your Muslims over, and you will send me my Orthodox people over. Pakistan, in 1947, followed our example, we can be proud of it. Pakistan did the same with India, because of that. They followed 1947, what happened in 1923 between Greece and Turkey. Albania, Yugoslavia, what became Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Romania, never did that. So they had their Muslim, Turkish minorities in their country until nowadays. But they were suppressing them until recently. Bulgaria, in the 1990s, kicked the Muslims even out of Turkey. They told them, you have to change your names, you have to, you, you cannot, you have to baptize, you have to become Christian. All this stuff, it made an exodus, mass exodus. Bulgarians went to Turkey at that time. Okay? Romania, big problem. Big issues. All these gypsies you see outside there, they're actually originally Muslim. They're Muslim. They came from there. They have no idea what is now. But they know that they cover. They have no idea what they cover. Okay? Albanians, until recently, they didn't know how to spell Islam. Because in Albania it was forbidden. Any religion was forbidden in Albania. Yugoslavia, the same. But in Yugoslavia, the Muslims in Yugoslavia, in Bosnia or in whatever else, there were Serbia, Kosovo, whatever, they would intermarry non-Muslim women, they would intermarry with non-Muslim women, and they would become worse than them. They would start drinking, they would actually not respect Islam at all, they would not pray, nothing. And this was the downfall of these people. Is it true that Albania was the first like, communist? That was the first real secular communist country in the world. Okay? No religion was allowed. Yes? It's still, there's Bulgarian who speak Turkish as well. Because yes, of course, Frank is, is Bulgarian, but he speaks Turkish. Yes. And sometimes the Bulgarians, if you say the Bulgarians, are you Turkish? No. They hate it. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Or if you tell them, you know, you have Bulgarian people who speak Turkish, they, you know, they get funny about it. That's right. All this has to do with their history, what they, what they were told. Not because it was like this, because they were told these things. Okay? And that's what we're trying to correct. I'm trying to correct the image, and that's why I'm going over time, because I really need to correct the image that people have wrongfully about the, the Ottomans. And hey, listen, listen, nothing is perfect. Nobody is perfect, and neither were the Ottomans, nor the Mayas, nor the Abbasids. Nobody was perfect. But we have to correct the wrong image. Okay? That's all I'm saying here. So I just want you to take a look at this one here. What happened? Have you ever heard of the Srebrenica massacre? The Srebrenica massacre refers to the July 1995 killing. More than 8,000 Bosnian Muslims, mainly men and boys, in and around the town of Srebrenica were rounded up and killed by units of the Army of Republika Srpska under the command of General Ratko Mladic. This genocide is the largest mass murder in Europe since World War II and the largest massacre carried out by Serb forces during the Bosnian War. Eyewitness reports and whoever feels that they cannot go through that, some of them maybe were here last year, eyewitness reports tell us what happened. I saw how a young boy of about 10 was killed by Serbs in Dutch uniform. This happened in front of my own eyes. The mother sat on the ground and her, her young son sat beside her. The young boy was placed on his mother's lap. The, the young boy was killed. His head was cut off. The body remained on the lap of the mother. The Serbian soldier placed the head of the young boy on his knife and showed it to everyone. I saw how a pregnant woman was slaughtered. There were Serbs who stabbed her in the stomach, cut her open and took two small children out of her stomach and then beat them to death on the ground. I saw this with my own eyes. The Serbs began at a certain point to take girls and young women out of the group of refugees. They were raped. The rapes often took place under the eyes of others and sometimes even under the eyes of the children of the mother. A Dutch soldier stood by and he simply looked around with a walkman on his head. He did not react at all to what was happening. It did not happen just before my eyes, for I saw them personally, but also before the eyes of us all. The Dutch soldiers walked around everywhere. It is impossible that they did not see. Now, if you think that people could do things and call themselves still people, you know? And it's not just because they did this to Muslims, okay? Things like this happened in the past as well, okay? And of course Muslims committed atrocities as well, because they are people. But this hatred that is on the Balkan, and I know these people very well, I'm from Monotov. I'm, these are my people, okay? 
the Balkan Peninsula, the Balkan people, carry this inside of them. For whatever reason, they have such a hatred towards Muslims. They have such a hatred towards people who, who even just have an Islamic name, maybe not even praying or something. Because Bosnian people were not praying, guys. Before the Bosnian war, they did not even know that they had to make fire salam the way. You know, a Bosnian brother in Germany told me once, he said, listen, it's all right, it's bad what happened. But you know what? Allah is actually rewarding us. It is actually something that is good for us. Because he is telling us here now, guys, you went too far that time. You are now have to come back again. And you know, since the Bosnian war in the 1990s, how many girls started wearing hijabs, younger age already in Bosnia, not only in Bosnia, but also in Germany. Yugoslavian people, Bosnian people wave in Germany and Austria. Many of them started wearing hijabs. Men going to the mosque, which had never, they never knew what a mosque looked like from inside. Okay? They stopped drinking. Nowadays, I'm telling you, I have met so many Bosnians, and I've, met so, I've been to so many Bosnian centers in Europe. In Luxembourg, for example, the biggest center is a Bosnian center, mashallah. Beautiful people, wonderful people, amazing. I had always the impression of my experience of 22 years being a Muslim, born Muslims are really pathetic, which is in general true. But hey, if you look at Bosnians, Wallahi, there is nobody who disagrees with me who knows Bosnians. You will find honey. You will find they will die for you. And they're strong people, tough people. They became also strong and tough. Okay? And they would die for Islam nowadays. They did not, they would die for alcohol before, now they die for Islam. Subhanallah. So, when Allah is talking about, you know, maybe something seems bad for you, but the result is good. Okay? So, yes, it was terrible what happened. Anyway, we have shuhada, right? These people who died in the Bosnian war, inshallah, shuhada. So now, when we look at that, that might look to us like it's something bad. Yes, but the result is positive. The result is positive. Last thing I want to say, last thing I want to say. You know, um, I just wanted to think about one thing. You know, I'm not uh, trying to make any kind of prognosis here or something, but I'll tell you one thing. There was once a time, 700 years, Muslims were living in Europe, in Spain. What happened to them? Nobody has survived. There were once a time, 250 years, Muslims were living in Sicily. What happened to them? Gone. There was once a time they were living in Switzerland. What happened to them? Gone. There was once a time they were living in Greece, in the Balkans. The ones who have remained still face problems and difficulties until the Bosnian War 1992. Now the only thing I'm saying is not paranoia. Do not feel too comfortable where you are. Okay? Do not feel that everything is cool and fine and nice because we got the British nationality and we accept it and we have our mosques and we have everything. You know, I just want you to sleep awake. I want you to sleep with open eyes, okay? Do not fall asleep. Do not think that everything is fine and nice because we have seen in the past, and that's what we have to learn from our past. We have to learn from our history, that in the past, we used to have Muslim countries in Europe. Spain was a Muslim country for 700 years. Portugal was a Muslim country for 500 years. Sicily was a Muslim country for 200 years, and so on and so on. There were generations who were Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, Muslims. They don't exist anymore. So do not feel <coughs> comfortable. Do not think that that's how it's going to be forever. That there is an establishment of Islam in certain countries that we're living in the West. You know, we have to be careful. Because wherever there was Christians who ruled Muslim minorities, they did, it didn't last long. So it's not paranoia I'm trying to spread here. I'm just, I want you just to sleep awake. You know, to use open eyes and be aware of your deen. Do not lose it, because if you assimilate, you remember integration and assimilation yesterday? If you assimilate into non-Muslim societies, you're lost. That's it, done. Just your name, you know, will indicate to them, like the Bosnians. Just because they were called Ahmed, Mohammed, but they were not praying. They were not even, they didn't know, they were drinking. They were married to non-Muslim women. And still, they took them out of their, can you imagine? They went to villages. 
and the only indicator they had, they would go to families' places, to homes, and they would ask the men to pull down their trousers to see if they're circumcised. That was the only way to see if these guys were Muslims. They did not know who was Muslim and who was not. The only way was to see if they were circumcised. Can you believe that? That's how far it went. And still, this old man who had never prayed in his life, they put him on a truck and they took him away. You know how many people died in this genocide? Srebrenica, the worst genocide after World War II. In a, con in a continent, Europe, where we say this can never happen again. After the Second World War, when the Jews came back and they said, never again. In Germany, we always learn at school, niemals wieder, never again. You know, is it just for the Jews that counts now? It doesn't count for us anymore? It doesn't count for others? So, you know, the only thing I'm saying, not paranoia, I'm just saying, just be careful, wake up, practice your deen, and the only thing that can happen then to you is shaheed, right? But imagine you don't even practice your deen and you die for Islam, which you don't even know. Imagine. Just imagine. SubhanAllah. So anyway, <clears throat> was a little bit a more emotional one today. We are inshallah coming back in January. We will still let you know. Are there any questions from your side? Didn't have the chance to, make some, to ask any questions today, but I will do it in general. Because I found it important still to go through some issues that are of extreme importance, I find, which play a role for today. I think all this that we discussed today will hopefully get you to understand the world in a different way around you. Look at what's happening around you. Look what happened 1992 to 1995, as I was 20 years old. That's when I accepted Islam. I accepted Islam in 1992. And that's when, the that, that's when the massacres happened. You know, and people were telling me, are you sure it's a good time to become Muslim now? You know? When is a good time? Now? After this was Kuwait. After this was Iran, Iraq, uh, Iraq. You know, whatever. Everything. After this one, nothing stopped. Iraq, Syria, everything. What? When is a good time then? So never is a good time. Or always is a good time. Okay? So don't let them dishearten you. Because people, of course, will just look at this outer, superficial appearance, right? They will not look at what the deen actually means. And the deen is massive. Okay, and there's a lot we can all learn. Subhanaka la umma wa bihamdi ashadu la ilaha ila anta staffil wa tawadu.